from Base Lessons Melbourne here again and today I'm joined by Dave Anderson for our, our player profile video. So Dave, it's um it's great to have you here man. Oh great to have you. I appreciate you calling me Craig. It's uh no it's a pleasure to be here and hang out with uh one of the uh the base brethren, you know, the worldwide base <laughs> team. The, the community we gotta, we gotta stick together, look yeah. after each other. So That's how are you how are you enjoying your time in Melbourne? It, it's it's wonderful. Uh, I'm having a great time and I'm, I I actually had some trepidation um, uh, j really, uh, just because of the time change, you know, from right. yeah. from uh, New York in the states, it's uh, a fourteen-hour difference. And I've been on tour in China and Russia, and I've been to Japan, so I, I kind of know what that's like to kind of yeah. deal with that big of a shift. Um, it makes going to Europe, which is six hours ahead from us on the east coast of the states just seem like child's play by comparison. So I was just going like, I oh, know we're gonna have a great time, but oh my God, 14 hours, how am I gonna deal with that? And, and I don't know, as I've gotten older, I've gotten better at dealing with my body somehow can take that abuse better. I don't know why that is. Did you, you know, did you have a a day spare when you landed to We, we did, which is, yeah. and you know, I think we, we could have all sort of, you know, soldiered on and done the gig if we had to. Um, you know, uh, uh, for myself and for uh, Bill Evans, who I'm here with, uh, we came from New York, flew to LA, and then flew from LA to, to Melbourne. Um, <clears throat> so that that second flight, you know, you leave LA, you're already, you're pretty much ready to go to sleep New York time at that point if you left in the afternoon from New York. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're good at plane sleep, and I'm, I'm pretty good at plane sleep, yeah. I'm not one of those people that can't sleep on a plane. If I'm tired enough, I will. So you sort of fitfully get, get some sleep off and on. You wake up every 30 minutes and go, oh, oh my back's killing me, and you try to <laughs> wipe adjust. Wipe the drool Wipe the drool off your face. and <laughs> Apologize and, to the guy next Exactly. <laughs> adjust your earplugs and your eye shades and you know, yeah. tune back out again. <sighs> you know, you probably look like you're half dead, people yeah. walking by, you know. But, um, so when we landed, I kind of felt like, wow, I feel a little closer to normal than I expected. That's pretty good. So you, so you slept on the on the plane. On, on from, the plane, yeah. From the, yeah. So you, what time did you get to, to Melbourne? Is it morning? Uh, uh, what year is this? What what month is this? <laughs> um, I'm so turned around. Um, we we got in Monday, I guess. Yeah, we got in Monday morning. Yeah. And then so Tuesday night was our first uh, night at cool. Bird's Basement. Um, so we we had that day just to kind of uh, chillax and. Yeah. Uh, Get get into the groove and everything, and and uh, of course, as I mentioned on our, our trip over here, the wonderful thing about that club is that the the hotel is right above the club, and everything we need is right there. So, um, you know, uh, apart from venturing out just to enjoy the neighborhood, the, everything we need is is right there. Yeah, so it nice. makes it easier. It's not like okay, we got a forty minute drive to the venue every day, you know, yeah. from the hotel or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to the show tomorrow night. Oh, great! Um, nice. What what should I expect? What's what's the Bill Evans band? Well, um, have you heard Bill before? Have you heard him in some yeah, different I, settings? I had, I had a CD of his from from many years ago, mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of a mix of like Americana almost. Was it Soulgrass? I'm not sure what it was called. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't quite remember. Yeah, um, you know, B Bill uh, Bill is one of those musicians who uh, really his career is defined by kind of always seeking out something new and different to do um, on a night to night basis on the bandstand and from one record to the next mm -hmm. or from one band to the next he he really thrives on on fresh input and stimulus um, and and I think you know his his early years in his career we you know his first big gig was of course playing with Miles Davis in the 80s and I think and and he and Miles enjoyed a close friendship as well as working together musically and and I, I, I get the sense from 
you know, talking with Bill about that period of his life that, um, you know, a lot of Miles kind of ideas about how to be vital and creative and and not be stuck in one place or be complacent really kind of rubbed off on Bill and, and influenced the way he's shaped his his own musical ideas mm-hmm. and his career and everything. <clears throat> and and it's, it's, uh, I mean, Miles Davis, sorry, sorry, but Miles yeah. Davis really, one of the things mm-hmm. I think that stands out almost as much as his, as his musicianship is his almost producer, you know, skills in terms of producer as in selecting the people Absolutely. for the thing and you know going oh, Absolutely. this guy this guy and this guy and this, is, and this is the overall idea that we're doing mm-hmm. you know and he would maybe not even play <laughs> At, oh absolutely yeah. there's there's no question about that I mean you, that's a big you, part of his genius I think and it seems yeah. like that's what you're saying about, about Bill as well yeah to that a- absolutely I think Bill kind of took that template of mm. how to be a band leader from Miles and um, how to create the sound of a band how to give musicians direction and stuff um, you know, I've, I've uh, first worked with Bill about 10 years ago at this point, and I've been working with him pretty regularly um, w- with his own band for the last well, five, six years or so, and with a lot of different musicians. Mm. And he likes to mix things up and use different guys. Um, and uh, uh, when I first started playing with him, uh, he was kind of still in the middle of uh, a sound that he was going for with a particular instrumentation. He had done a record called Soulgrass with some of the big kind of crossover jazz fusion bluegrass guys from Nashville. Um, that was Bela Fleck. Bela Fleck. Bela Fleck. Um, okay. And uh, <laughs> Sam Bush, the great mandolinist, and uh, Jerry Douglas, and, mm-hmm. and, and then Victor Wooten, and Vinnie Colaudi. I mean, you know, yeah. monster guys. And, and so he did a, a, a record called Soul Grass, and, and it was all those guys, it was Bill's material, and those guys adding their flavor and sound and everything to the music. And, and I think it was something that, you know, uh, it was uh, something that Bill just lighted upon that was fresh and interesting to him. And, and he grew up in, in the middle of the United States, he's from Illinois. And, and kind of, I think, always had some of those kind of local, rural, country kind of sounds in his ears, as well as growing up with a, a, a passion as a young guy mm. for jazz and very quickly developing, you know, at an amazing level with, with that music and stuff. But he always had that other kind of sound in his ears, too. Um, so it was something that, that resonated for him. It's something that he liked and wanted to kind of take the ball and run with it. So he kind of, he had um, various incarnations of bands for for. Uh, for years after that, where he had a, a, an amazing uh, banjo player, electric mm. banjo player, the guy was incredible. Uh, Ryan Cavanaugh, he's like, he could do all the traditional bluegrass banjo stuff better than anyone else, and then he would play through a pedal board with his pickup and the banjo and sound like Alan Holdsworth. I mean, wow. it's just insane. Um, and then this amazing <clears throat> violinist named uh, uh, Christian Howes, who's probably one of the best improvisers in jazz on that instrument on the planet, right. you know, like an amazing player. So it was a, a high-powered band, mm. you know, I was just looking around going, what am I doing here, you know? Uh, it was uh, it was great, uh, but he was definitely still um, doing that crossover bluegrass fusion idea. And then over the years, you know, guys come and go, he wants to hear different stuff. He kind of got into this idea of um, pursuing more of the blues rock jam band mm-hmm. kind of sound and started making some kind of personal and musical connections with guys in that world. Um, he became friendly with Warren Haynes, who played guitar for years in the Allman Brothers and has his own group and is real popular in the States in, yep. in that kind of scene. And Greg Allman, the late uh, great Greg, who just passed uh, this mm-hmm. last week. Um, and a lot of other people in that scene. So it was kind of uh, an, another new thing for him to get into is to kind of be the guest artist as the jazz guy with, you know, the jam bandy kind of dudes. Right, okay. um, and a lot of that stuff is, you know, really based a lot more on improvisation than other kinds of rock and stuff. Mm. So it's a great fit for any jazz guys and certainly Bill. So he's, his sound started shifting kind of towards that direction. Um, and then the gig started, you know, he was starting to write tunes more in that kind of style and away from the, the bluegrass kind of sound. 
and um, then the banjo uh, guy kind of, you know, went off to pursue things with his own career a couple years ago. So since then, it's kind of been more like a, almost like a blues rock fusion guitar power trio with Bill in front. Right. But the interesting thing is that besides being obviously, you know, one of the world's greatest saxophonists, um, Bill's a very fine pianist and he's a great singer too. And he's been uh, doing... Uh, a lot more stuff singing and writing vocal tunes. So we've kind of gotten this interesting kind of crossover into the singer-songwriter kind of vibe with right. Bill going from that to the horn and stuff. So, you know, he's always looking for something new to challenge himself, you know, and it, it keeps changing the flavor of the, and he, of and the he, music. And you're happy to be along for the ride, obviously? Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. amazing. I mean, you know, every time Bill picks up the horn, you just listen to what he's coming up with and you just go... Oh my God! You yeah. know how did he how did he come up? It's just always this torrent of amazing ideas, you know. Um, and, and so and it, the, it, and the rest of the guys in the band aren't too. Oh you know, yeah, too pretty shabby. pretty amazing, right? Yeah. I mean Dean um, Brown and and, and Pooji. Yeah, and a Dean Pooji I'd played with previously in it with somebody else, so we already had you know a little inaugural kind of experience playing together, and I loved him right away. He's incredible. Um, you know, combination of the R&B groove thing with jazz complexity and subdividing yeah. and over the bar line stuff, really exciting and fun to play with. And D Dean, Dean I've known about for years and admired, but just playing with him this week and getting to know him personally. Is this first? For my first time, yeah. It's actually the first time this specific combination of guys has, has worked oh, together. Cool. So. It's fun for us because it's like, uh, you know, Bill has a history with each of the three of us over the years in different versions okay. of his band, but it's the first time all four of us have been a band yeah. you know, this week. So, excuse me, it makes it, uh, it's exciting for us because it's really, uh, it's like jumping out of an airplane together. Yeah, you know? and you, well, you, the good thing is you get a whole week of gigs to refine that. So. And it's been an amazing process. Yeah. Now we started Tuesday night and now already it feels like, wow, yeah, you know, we've been doing this for a while. Cool. <laughs> you know, and it's great. It, Dean's incredible. He's a real, yeah. he's a deep thinker, both uh, with the guitar in his hands and as a person. Mm. And it's been really fun for me to, to start to get to know him personally and musically and appreciate, you know, kind of how much he's got going on. He's really, really an amazing dude. Yeah, and obviously mm -hmm. both of those guys, um, did a bit of work with Marcus. Yeah, that's right. I try not to think about that. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't. Say, I just. <laughs> I'm pushing that thought out of my head. I don't need to think about the fact that one of my idols when I was a young guy was uh, these guys were in his band. I'm just putting that aside. Yeah. Just yeah, we're just playing some music. You know, that's all. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe maybe I'll put the thumb away from this one. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's funny. It's there, when I was a lot younger. When I was a young guy, kind of making my way in in the New York scene in my late twenties and in my thirties. You know, I was. I didn't have the confidence I have now. I didn't have the experience, you know, and all the gigs and the years under my belt that I do now. And I would be, you know, subbing for some pretty heavy dudes and playing with some pretty heavy dudes, and it was freaking me out. You yeah. know, it's just, you know, when I was subbing for Anthony Jackson, I was subbing for uh, Mark Egan wow. um, and Victor Bailey. Uh, well, in yeah. fact, I got the gig with Bill. The, the first time I got the gig with Bill was kind of an emergency call because something happened. Victor Bailey had been doing the gig and. And something happened with his schedule at the last second, and he couldn't do a tour that Bill had coming up. And it was like Bill called me from Japan, and he said, "Can you go to Japan in two weeks? Or can you go to Europe in two weeks?" He called me from Japan. I was like, "Uh, uh okay," <laughs> you know. Wow. And we knew each other already. We had already done some playing and stuff, uh, so it wasn't just completely a cold call, but. So yeah, you know, that kind of stuff freaked me out when I was young. And I'd be sitting there going, oh my God, I'm subbing for Anthony Jackson. I'm freaking out. Do, do, should I try to sound like him? Should mm. I try to sound like me? I don't even know, I'm sure if I know what I sound like yet, you know? So it's kind of this, uh, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. But you know, after years of just doing it, you just go, you know what? All, all I can do is be me. Yeah. So that's the one thing I know I'm good at. Take, so and that's it. You know, that's a, mm. one bit of advice that I was given is take solace in the fact that nobody else sounds like you. Right. You know, and that's, for better or for worse. That's, that's right. That's, that's right. the only thing that you can do and just make yeah. that make that as a, an attractive a thing as possible. And and, yeah. and also trust that people are calling you to be you, mm -hmm. you know, um, right. not to try and be like and somebody absolutely. else. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it takes some confidence. You know, some people have that kind of cocky self-confidence right out of the gate when they're young. I, I kind of envy that in a way. Mm -hmm. I certainly did not have that. It took me, 
years to kind of convince myself that I belonged there, you right. know. Were you, and were um, you living in, in New York? I, I grew up in, well, I was born in uh, New Jersey, uh, not far from, from uh, the city, and then I grew up in Connecticut. So I've always, you know, except when I've been on the road or lived in a few other places over <clears> the years, I've spent, you know, a good part of my life within an hour or so of, of New York City. So yeah. it was always there. As soon as I had my driver's license as, a, as an 18-year-old, you know, it was like, boom, I'm going to the city. I'm going to get a Village Voice, which was the newspaper that had all the club listings for yep. the jazz clubs and go into town and, and go to the Village Vanguard and go to yeah. Sweet Basil and go to all the all the jazz clubs, you know, uh, at the time. And, and then you can go hear your idols. I mean, I remember hearing, um, going to, uh, I always loved all the ECM stuff and Keith mm -hmm. Jarrett, you know, and Matheny and 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 uh, all, all those you know all the great musicians that have recorded for Manfred Eicher, um, and I was a Jarrett fan. I loved his all his stuff with his different bands and his solo piano stuff. And when he first put the band together with Gary Peacock and Jack DeJohnette, that trio, they they played uh, for a week at the Vanguard, and I went the first night they played. Mm. So I literally, and I was sitting, like as close as we're sitting, I was like, Jarrett was facing the piano like that way. And if he had fallen off the piano stool, I would have caught him in my lap, you know? <laughs> and I was just had my eyes closed. I mean, I had so many great experiences like yeah. that as a young guy going to hear legendary players. I mean, I'm so glad I got to hear, uh, you know, I mean, I heard El Elvin Jones and mm. Frank Foster and <clears throat> Pepper Adams, you know, the old Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band. It was, Thad Jones wasn't there, but Mel was still alive at the time. So many, so many great bands. Oh yeah. my God, you know, look back on it now, it's like a lot of years ago. So would you say, did you have a, a jazz education or, I mean, were you a, I, I you went a, to, a pop guy I, well, I, I, you know, as a player and as a, as a listener, I'd say my tastes were eclectic and really all over the map. Um, but in my, I, I went to Berkeley College of Music, okay. and and when I was started out uh, as a bass player, started playing bass in high school, and was kind of didn't really. I actually I should back up a little bit. I w I played classical violin. My parents were music teachers oh. and and professional musicians, um, so I grew up in a house where everybody could really play. Um, you know, my dad still sight reads me under the table. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like that's the kind of family I grew up in. So, um, uh, so I had that classical background and everything. I was playing classical violin and I played trombone in the concert band and stuff. So, you, so you when I first picked a stuff. bass up, I already could read treble and bass clef fluently. I just had to get the Mel Bay book, how to play bass in a combo. You know, boom. And then I just went. You know, it was like. And then what's the next one? <laughs> you know, so that's and that was been your gig in seven nights a week. And six, six. I'm, I kid you not. Six months later, I'm playing in a wedding band. You know, so um, yeah, there it's you that go. Easy, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, but you know, I in in my idealistic youth, uh, in my after going to Berkeley and being exposed to so much amazing music up there, uh, you know, I I kind of I had my my heart set on. Playing what you want to call it, jazz or improvised music, serious music. You yeah. know, I, I didn't have a deaf ear to rock and funk and R and B, but it it wasn't kind of the main place I was looking. I I, I saw jazz as this monstrous mountain to climb, and mm -hmm. I wanted to scale that mountain. You know, to try to learn improvisation and the language and hear mm -hmm. hear what people were playing and and all that stuff that takes years to to. You know, Did you have some good tutors at Berkeley for that? I, you know, I had the the basic curriculum at Berkeley is is I'm sure it's changed a lot over the, mm. the since the many years that I've been there. But um, uh, uh, the the core curriculum there was so effective: um, harmony, ear training, arranging, um, and and all the other stuff that I think if you're reasonably diligent, you can't help but just you know kind of have a really solid base from that to work from um and i certainly did although and i was just talking about this with um dean actually the other day you know, we both went to berkeley he was there a bit before me but um you know there was a lot of stuff i learned at berkeley that intellectually i understood but i didn't understand pragmatically how to apply it or what it really meant in a musical sense mm. um 
I just was like kind of dutifully learning what I was told to learn. And it took some years of going out and doing gigs to go, ah, that's what they meant. That's what that's for. Now I get it. Yeah. Because I would hear it in action. I started playing with, you know, when you're the young guy, when you're young, you're starting out for years as a young guy, for some years, I was always the youngest guy in the bandstand. And I was always playing with older players. So you're playing with older guys that are better than you and more experienced and they're bossing you around and telling you what to do and not what not to do. But you're learning from all that, yeah. you know. And, you know, learning from, I, when, when the learning shifts from book type learning, which is valid, but it's just one aspect of learning, to learning on the bandstand and, you know, play with a great piano player who's voicing chords a certain way, and you listen and you hear how voice leading, how voices are moving in a chord, and what you need to be doing underneath that, and how to not get in their way and support mm. what's going on, all that stuff that you learn. Um, you know, the bandstand school of musical knowledge, you know. Um, how to how to you know tuck in underneath the singer when they come in in the verse so you're not overpowering them. How to get behind a soloist you know and, mm. and push them without stepping on their toes. You know all the stuff that takes years to learn. Yeah, yeah. and then and, and soloing yeah. chops was that something that you were always working on? Uh, yeah, you know I did, and it's, it's funny. I'm, <laughs> I'm 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 laughing because it's like, in in, in a sense, not to seem cynical, but. I really feel like knowing how to solo well on bass has got to be one of the most useless <laughs> things that, that you could really apply your time and attention to. The amount of time you spend trying to do it relative to the amount of time you actually end up doing it. Well that and also I think that there's a lot of, I didn't appreciate as a younger player that there were a lot of important things I needed to learn about being a good bass player both in terms of the vocabulary and understanding the language of different genres of music so that I could create effective bass lines that sounded good, that worked, and learning repertoire, which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, look, I'm not beating myself up for it. There's, it's, it. There are gigs where I get a chance to do some soloing. Certainly Bill's gig is one of them, and that's fine. I yeah. take one or two solos a night with Bill, um, and, uh, and that's great. Um, but... I, I think that the the double-edged sword is that I remember as a young player in my late 20s, I was playing the six-string bass, which we talked about before, and so I was really diligently working on my chops up and down the whole range of the neck and into the guitar register, and I was even, I had gotten some guitar um, chord books and was uh, basically mm -hmm. translating guitar chord fingerings to the six-string bass. and and trying to learn to play some, you know, jazz guitar chords and chord melody stuff on the bass. So it all seemed like, you know, high-minded, exciting stuff at the time. But what you kind of have blinders on when you're young is you don't realize you go to the gig and you start playing that way, and the other musicians are going, would you please stop that and just play some bass, you know? I Actually, one of my, my first kind of name artist gig, I guess you could say, uh, for me in my in my later 20s was the late great uh, New York studio guitarist Joe Beck not to be confused with Jeff Beck mm. um, and Joe had a career as one of the top guys in New York studios in the 60s and 70s and he kind of took me under his wing which was wonderful and I, I learned a lot from mm. Joe about m both music and life uh, from playing with him but I remember one time we were doing this gig we, we was trio gigs just bass and Joe and and um and a drummer, great drummer, young drummer about my age. And, you know, I was doing the best I could. Young guy, I'm like 28, 29 years old, whatever, and, you know, just, you know, digging in and going for it. And and we played some tune, and I played a solo, and I guess I was probably, you know, feeling pretty proud of myself. Yeah, I just played some cool shit, man, you know. <laughs> and, and I looked over at Joe, and he just gave me this, like, withering look, <laughs> and, and he said, I'll leave out the expletive here, but he said, why don't you just play the mm, guitar? And, you know, at the time I thought it was kind of funny, but then as I got older and wiser, I realized, yeah, you know what, he's, act he's absolutely right. You know, I'm the bass player, he's the guitar player. Yeah. It's not my job to sound like the guitar player, that's his job, you know. Sound like the bass player, that's what people want, and that's what they're paying Ex you for. Exploit the differences. Yeah, exactly. And. So I'm, I'm glad that I have fluency as an improviser. I'm glad I can think melodically mm. and I have that, that vocabulary. I'm glad I, I don't regret putting the time into that, but the reality is um, when I'm doing my day-to-day -day job with different 
artists or different gigs day to day around New York or whatever I'm doing, regardless of the, the genre of music, it, it's really not a, it's not a, you know, indispensable a skill. Yeah. You know, I could just leave. In fact, there was actually a period of time for me where um, I, I kind of, I had this idea that I wanted to divest myself of that part of my reputation. I thought, I want to start getting called for some, you know, better paying pop gigs and rock gigs and stuff. And I'm, I'm feeling kind of hamstrung like people have me typecast as a fusion guy. Yeah. I was playing the six string bass. So you got to get, I, the, you gotta and, get the 60s P bass. Yeah. Oh, well, I got the Sadowski. So right. it was like one less string. My running joke with some of my friends is I had to learn to solo an octave lower, you know. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and I started getting some gigs that I think I wouldn't have gotten if I hadn't really made a deliberate shift in my mindset yeah, right. and how I approach things. I got the gig with Art Garfunkel and toured with him for years, oh. which was great. And, you know, in terms of the requirements for me from the bass chair on, on that particular gig, you know, I would sit, you know, the, the, the thrust of that music, I'm not <clears> sure you're familiar with the classic Simon and Garfunkel music. It's beautiful, Paul Simon doing his you know, acoustic guitar and art singing and the two of them harmonizing and it's lovely and there's band and stuff. There's a, a you know, a, a group behind them yeah. on those records, but the group isn't, it's not like loud and proud pounding grooving. It's just a nice little accompaniment in the background. Steve Gadd, you know. Yeah, but if you listen to how Steve Gadd is mixed, yeah. you know, it's not up in your face. It's no. it's make it's just politely behind yeah. the voices and the guitar, the piano. That's the focus. So, you know, it was a, a good lesson for me in understanding, you know, what's appropriate and important. You mm -hmm. know, a typical song with art, be some beautiful little introduction, and then art would sing the verse, maybe the verse and the chorus or whatever, the refrain. And I'd just be sitting there smiling with my hands in my lap waiting. And then for the bridge, you know, I would, you know, come in with something like this. And then I'd sit with my hands in my lap again until the end of the tune. And that was it, you know. And it was almost like kind of thinking like an orchestral player, yeah. like the way you would in a string section or something. Okay, we got 64 bars of rest to count, and we all come in with the arco or yeah. whatever. Um, Make it count. Yeah, so, you know, there's there's kind of, there, there was an, a good maturing on my part, I think, by really deliberately deciding uh, to put away childish things, so to speak, and, <laughs> and drop the six string and drop the propensity towards the soloing and stop saying yes to all those low-bred fusion guitar trio gigs and <laughs> and start trying to get some good paying gigs where people could depend on me to just be a solid foundational yeah. you know rhythm section player and uh and it, and it worked you know um and then now i feel like i went through a period of kind of being a little maybe um, overly deliberate about trying to sell that as what my image was or what I offered. And now at this point, I feel like, okay, I did all that and I did a bunch of nice gigs that kind of allowed me to kind of get into some different areas like that. And, and now I'm just kind of happy to just kind of approach each gig for what it needs. And I'm not anxious about like, I got to sound a certain way, do this or do that. I just be myself, Yeah. you know? Yeah, cool. Yeah. And were there some were there some players who were a bit of an influence to you when you were growing up and, and, and digging into the instrument? Well, um, I actually, you know, again, coming from the classical background, I kind of, I discovered rock and like this rush of excitement. Um, I think, you know, some of the first stuff I heard was Jimi Hendrix, Experience, mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin, um, uh, and, and a lot of stuff from that era. Um, and, I loved Rush, I loved Van Halen, you know, late, I was in high school in the late 70s, so all the stuff that was current at the time, some of that stuff has stood the test of time, some of it hasn't, certainly, but I was into the rock of the day, the kind of the hard rock of the mm -hmm. day, and also progressive rock like Yes and, and King Crimson and things like that. Um, uh, so certainly for me, I mean, when I first sat there, showing my age now, but this was picking up the needle on the record player mm. and dropping it on the tracks and then sitting there uh, laboriously getting one or two notes at a time. And the first bass players that I sat there and worked out note for note like that were John Paul Jones with Led Zeppelin and Chris Squire with Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, Getty Lee, of course, after that. And then, you know, a bunch of other stuff. So kind of started with the rock thing. Yep. 
But then I, I was really fortunate to have a wonderful uh, <clears throat> teacher in high school. My parents kind of pointed me towards going uh, to study privately with a great teacher. And this guy's still around. He's not actually not that much older than me. His name's Dave Santoro. Um, great, uh, serious, upright, double bassist in jazz and played with a lot of heavy people uh, in that world. And he just threw me right in the deep end. It was like, okay, the first lesson I was, um, I had to learn all the modes of the major scale and um, come back and be able to play them up and down. This is my first lesson. I'm like a sophomore in high school, okay? Yeah, right. And I'd been playing for about a year maybe, if that. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then he started throwing some um, you know, some hip like Sam Jones or Oscar Pettiford or some other upright stuff at me, some heads. He wrote out like this walking line on all the things you are and I had to memorize it. Are you, um, are you playing upright or electric? No, electric. Yeah, electric, okay. yeah. Um, so I, right away I kind of got, it was like, oh, okay, there's something much hipper and heavier that mm -hmm. I kind of got into. So that was the beginning of really kind of starting to study the jazz stuff. Um, so that was kind of the early years, high school, the rock stuff, getting into the jazz thing, went to Berkeley. And then I would say the shift for me at that point was that I started thinking in terms of, you know, I wasn't even thinking about like, what do I want my career to be? I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but then I kind of got out of school. I was like, now I really have to do something. Okay, I gotta get, get my act together. What am I gonna do? So I would look around and like I said, I was lucky to be close to New York City, driving in New York and, and here stuff all the time at clubs and I saw that the guys that seemed to be like the hippest you know most uh, you know the heaviest players were the New York studio guys it was Will Lee mm. and Anthony Jackson and a young Marcus Miller um, and and all those other guys that were Mark Egan you know that were kind of on the scene there was this great guy uh, Wayne Pedswater you know all these great players and and I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to be like, you know, go in and sight read anything, play any style, play it right the first time, go into yep. a studio, you know, no matter what it calls for. And and so that was, I started modeling my playing and my career aspirations after those guys. And it's just not a bad, yeah, you know, not a bad angle. Yeah, and it was great because I would go hear those guys playing in clubs, their after hours gigs, like the mm. Bracker Brothers own this club called Seventh Avenue South, right. at the bottom of Seventh Avenue in, this, in in Greenwich Village, and would go there and hear like the most amazing stuff. Oh, unbelievable! I think about some of the stuff I yeah. heard, and then Mike Stern, after he had played with Miles, uh, had a, a regular gig at this little place. Uh, in the village called the 55 Bar, and it was himself and um, Harvey Schwartz, the great uh, upright bass player, and Adam Nussbaum, the drummer. And I would just go down there, and it was like this little dive bar. It wasn't a heavy jazz club. It was just a neighborhood watering hole with a popcorn machine and cheap beer. But these guys, it was in his neighborhood, and that's where he just wanted to play all the time. And we'd go down there and sit there like acolytes, you know, sitting there soaking up every note of Mike Stern watching him play, you know, 28 choruses on all the things you are or whatever. And and it was it was amazing. So I was kind of, I was inspired by and looking up to all those New York jazz studio type mm. dudes. Jeff Andrews was another guy, one of the greatest unsung players mm. ever, in my opinion, yeah. on the instrument. What a monster Did he is. Did he play is. with Mike Stern? For yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he was, uh, Harvey Swartz kind of moved on from that trio with Mike and Jeff was his replacement. And uh, Jeff was a you know young guy at the time, and sounded incredible. And um, and then subsequent to that, Michael Brecker um, chose basically Mike's trio, Mike plus his guys, to be his backing band after he made his first solo record. Um, so you know, there's some amazing stuff on YouTube with yeah. Jeff Andrews with those guys. I mean, he's he's an incredible player, unbelievable. Um, so that was my inspiration. Those were the guys I was looking up to, the New so, York dudes. But also I knew there was the studio scene in LA and I knew all the great guys out there, Abe Laboreal and mm. Neil Steubenhaus and all those kind of dudes. And, and so I was kind of, I would go as a young guy, I would go to the record store. Um, kids, we used to have record stores, you know. <laughs> um, and you'd go and I'd be flipping through the stacks and sure there were artists or 
people, musicians, bands that I was interested in. Oh, I got to get the new Steps Ahead record or whatever. But also, I would just flip it over. And the nice thing in the old days, it was 12 by 12 with the list of the musician credits and the producer and the studio in the back. And I'd look, and if it said, you know, Will Lee or Marcus or any of those guys, I would just buy the record. I didn't care what the music was. Yeah. I needed to listen to those guys and say, what are they doing on this track? What, what are they doing? What did he do on that? You know, like trying yeah. to gleam as much information as I could from what those guys were doing in their day-to-day -day work playing on people's records. Yeah, cool. You know? Yeah, yeah. And um, you ever had your own, like your own thing? My own band or project? Yeah, your own I, band or project. I, I have, yeah. You know, um, like, like you were saying, you know, we're the, you know, our job is the sideman. You know, yeah. Coming to this, you, you spend your life playing other people's music. Well, and, that, um, that's really the story of my life by and large. I mean, I, I am an inveterate sideman. And, and I'm proud of it. I mean, that's that's what I set out to do. I'm yeah. I, I'm certainly not uh, in that sense like a a failed wannabe star or something of that regard. My my intention. I think I was lucky because my parents mm -hmm. were professional musicians and and educators, and so they instilled in me a very kind of rational way of viewing that process. You were going to acquire your skills. Um, and be diligent and work on that, get to a high level, and then you'd associate with better people, and then you'd go from there, you know? It wasn't like, I want to be famous, you know? So, um, so that's what I was always aspiring to. So, you know, I've been really happy doing what I do. I play with a million different people. I've played on, uh, you know, a ton of records, mm. um, uh, but there's no Dave Anderson record, you know? Um, not to say that there couldn't be. I certainly um, have a lot of things that I could put out there. Of course, as we know in this day and age, I mean, the record business, such as it is, has changed so drastically yeah. um, in, over the years that I've, I've had my career in music since the early 80s um, and the whole brick and mortar, mortar music uh, store thing and the record industry and downloads and streaming and all that stuff. I mean, it's all changed <clears throat> so much. I mean, in a, in a sense, in a very real sense now, um, you know, if you're going to make a record and people still do it, you know, uh, obviously. Um, the remuneration from that, it almost has to be seen as like a loss leader in a sense or an expensive business card, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I, but, uh, but the flip side of that is yeah. that it's easier than ever to make a record and well, release it. There's no question about it. There's no you know, question about I mean, it. Um, and then, but then the double-edged sword, the irony there is that there is um, so much noise, the noise level out there on the interwebs in terms of people promoting their own stuff, mm. social media, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're like me, you got tons of friends on Facebook, fellow musicians and people promoting their stuff and, and all that kind of stuff. And just the noise level of people mm. putting their thing out there. Mm. Um, it's, um, you know, it's almost like, you know, if there's a million people trying to promote their thing. I mean, I see this all the time. I, I work with, you know, people that are just trying to get their thing off the ground. If it's good music, I like to be involved, you know, sure. as opposed, or not as opposed, but as well as, um, you know, established, you know, top level artists and stuff, um, equal opportunity employee. I like to work with anybody and everybody as long as it's going to be good music and, you know, a good time and they're going to pay yeah. me something in there. Um, but it's, um, it's so hard for new artists to build and find an audience and it's even harder to get them to pay anything mm. to hear your music whether it's paying a door charge or paying for a download or or whatever it might be i mean i'm not i guess i'm in a sense it seems like i'm suggesting that the criteria for deciding to be an artist or to do your own thing is purely financial and certainly that's not not the case um it's a factor but it can't be the only factor um, but it, it, it's a sobering, um, it's a sobering change in, in the, the landscape of the business. And, you know, the reality is I've, I've been really exceptionally fortunate and lucky that as in my adult life, I've really done very little else besides pick up the bass and play it to make mm -hmm. a living, you know? And I was, I was married for years, supported a family by doing that. I did several Broadway shows, or the session work I've done. <clears throat> I've toured all over the world. I've played with a lot of cool people. It's all great, and I'm grateful for all that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've done a bit of teaching over the years off and on, but it's never been like a, a, a steady or a kind of a, a, any appreciable part of my, my pie chart, so to speak. So I've really just done it by being a player. 
Um, and you know, if you're going to do your own project, you kind of have to shift that whole attitude on its head. And you have to say, well, okay, I have to invest in this now. I have to invest in myself. And you, and you have to go into it with the expectation that you're going to spend money before you're going to make money. And um, that can be a tough pill to swallow when you've been used to people handing you a paycheck every time you pick up the base and paying yeah. your, your rent or mortgage and your bills with that for years and years. Um, uh, so anyway, having said all that, I do have a really cool project that uh, it's something I've done with a, a couple friends of mine for the last few years, and it's it's uh, two other friends of mine that I've known for a long time doing this do the same thing I do. They're busy playing as side men for all kinds of different people, and busy doing gigs and traveling all over the place. So it's kind of one of those things where we do it when we can, when we can all get together, uh, and we call it the New Dinosaurs. It's a, a trumpet player named Don Harris who was the lead trumpet player in Tower of Power. He was in James Taylor's band. He was in uh, Chic with Nile Rodgers wow. for years. He was like, like top level touring guy, like one of the top you know, trumpet guys in you know, the touring rock scene. And the, the a drummer who's an old friend, a very old friend of mine, Tiger McNeil, who was in um, Jose Feliciano's band for many years and was in the Average White Band before that. Fantastic drummer. And he's uh, got this kind of cool hybrid electronic percussion thing with loops and okay. everything that, like that that he does. So we have this cool project. It's ba a power trio of bass, trumpet, and drums. and drums. And Don has a pedal board for his trumpet with all these pedals that's Ooh. more than most guitar players have. <laughs> so he'll hit a note in the trumpet and it just sounds like a big synth wash, like oh, this cool. big polyphonic synth wash. Um, so we've got this cool project and uh, but it's sort of like waiting in the wings as all of us deal with the day-to-day -day pragmatic yeah. necessities of making a living and yeah. keeping our bills paid. And in the case of my 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 buddy Tiger, he's got uh, a son in college and a daughter who's going to be there in a few years. So you yeah. know, when you got a family to take care of, you know, the the uh, luxury of going out and doing your own own little gig and spending money to do it rather than making it is yeah. is uh, you know. It's uh, you have to sort of uh, pick your battles or plan your dance steps, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's certainly something that I would say to just to kind of go back to answer your question. Um, it's something that I would like to make a bigger part of the picture for myself because mm. the reality is I'm in my my mid fifties. I've been lucky to to be able to do this uh, and continue to do it, but. Uh, you know, there is certainly a good degree of ageism in the music business, as there are in a lot of other areas, and um, I, I certainly can't, you know, naively expect that I will continue to be able to be in demand 10, 15 years from now or, or more uh, uh, the way that I am now. Yeah. That's just the reality of the situation. So I think I'll, I'll, have, I'll stand a better chance of staying in the game, being able to play some music I love playing. And in kind of doing it on my own terms, if I start to make doing my own thing a bigger part of the, the pie chart, yeah, you yeah. know, so um, it's definitely something that I'm, it's kind of looming on the horizon in a good way for me, I guess you could say, yeah, to cool. start to transition away from just being a hired gun. Um, yeah, but when you can take all those years of experience and, and funnel it into something. Yeah, absolutely. Point, you know, instead of doing it when you were in your early twenties, when you didn't have that wealth of knowledge, you know, it's 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 a different thing mm -hmm. when you when you do it when you're older. So yeah, yeah, I look yeah. forward to hearing it when it yeah, comes to life. Yeah, we've we've done we've done some recording. The, the, actually, the interesting thing about the way we've been approaching it up to this point, uh, all of us write and and compose music, but what we have been doing is treating this as like a entirely improvised yeah. uh, setting. So we literally just hook everything up and it's like, all right, go, you know, cool. and then we just play and, and we've done some, we did a couple of local TV shows where we were featured on like a music show and a couple little festival things close to where we, mm. where we all live. And, um, and we'll just play and it's just like this stuff just unfolds. It's spontaneous. You're composing spontaneously. And, you know, there, inevitably there's going to be some moments where you're maybe treading water or waiting for the next idea to you know, fall yeah. out of the sky. But then, you know, there are these moments that just this incredible thing manifests. You know, the music shows itself to you and something incredible happens. And then you know, you're talking to people afterwards and they're, you know, they're saying, oh, my God, you guys are amazing. It was incredible. And, you know, 
how much of that was written out, and I'll laugh and I'll say, um, none of it. You know, we had no idea what was going to happen before yeah. we did it, and they just look at you like, you know, for a lay for me, some musicians, that's hard to hard to kind of wrap their head around. For a lay person, yeah. they they don't understand that the idea that you can have such a deep well of Mm. musical vocabulary and ideas and experience that you could just bring that to bear. Yeah, it's, in, it's, it's the culmination of your of your entire musical journey, I guess. Yeah, you know? it really is. Yeah. It really is. It's that's exciting that's, to that's have, a great way to put to, it. To have that idea. Discussing our our many years of gear, yeah, um, gear changes and stuff like that. So obviously this this is my bass you've got just now, but you're playing a you're playing a Sadowski. Yeah, right. And which I been, which yeah. I love. You've been using for a while. Yeah, incredible bass. I've I've had it for um, shoot, well, like fourteen years now, I guess 13, 14 years. It I, as, as I mentioned to you before, I've got a I've got a, a big collection of basses, but that's that's the one that's just always my my go-to bass, both in terms of me being most comfortable and happy with the way it sounds and feels, and also artists and producers and other musicians all just, yeah. you know, voting unanimously that that's the one they want to hear. You know, in fact, I brought my um, my six-string bass that I mentioned before out on a gig a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. I haven't played the six-string in a while. Yeah, this is, I put some new strings on it. The modulus. The modulus, right? And. And, and I had a great time playing it on the gig, <laughs> and and the, oh, the the guy whose band it was, he's, he's a great guy, a good friend of mine, and everything. And and he didn't say this in a nasty way, but he kind of smiled. He said, "Yeah, you know, I had the Sadowski, the, and the next gig I saw him, he says, yeah, I think I kind of like that one, the way that one sounds better.' I'm like, yeah, well, me too, you know. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> um, now I went through this phase with the Sadowski, you know, whatever. I mean, in hindsight, it seemed kind of silly, but I guess it it, it made sense to me. It worked at the time. I, I had this idea that I, I was going to use really light gauge strings. I think they were even like 35 Gs. Yeah. Um, they were roto sounds. Um, so just very sploingy, springy kind of strings. Um, but what I would do to ensure that the, the strings didn't like clatter or on the frets or bottom out down low is I had the relief, the truss relief was set really high. So in other words, there was a real exaggerated you know, bow to the neck, right. but then to compensate for that so the action was still playable, I had the bridge saddle set really low. It was really kind of weird, okay. right? So the idea was sort of, you know, you know how a truss rod works. Yeah. And, and so basically uh, the the relief would start to open up right away when yeah. you got into the second, third, fourth frets, but then with the saddle slow, it would kind of stay at a nice playable place all the way down here. So the strings were light, it was easy to push them down. So it felt very, you know, mm. effortless to play. It wasn't difficult to play because the, the neck relief was was way high. So I don't know. I had it that way for years. And I remember I, I was doing some gig with with um, with uh, Bill Evans and um, Will Lee was on the uh, this festival with another band. We're hanging out and talking. And, and he said, oh, let me take a look at your bass. And he looked at the saddles. He looked at the neck and everything. He's like... You know, he just looked at me like incredulous, like, "What are you doing? What is this?" I was like, "I was like, oh, sorry, Mr. Lee. I, like, you know, it just like works for me." You know, he's like looking at me like I'm like out of my mind. You know, but um, so then I kind of got over that. So now I'm back to like you know same thing gauges you're using, forty five to one thirty, and with my neck really pretty close to flat with no relief. And I guess I, I kind of arrived at that. After having um, Roger's shop um, do some repair work on the instrument, I had a complete 
um, refret done, new nut, new frets, just like kind of be- clean the clock and get it back to, you know, better than new shape. And it was incredible. I mean, mm-hmm. his his crew are amazing. Um, uh, you know, they're really so great. And um, and you know, I was just thrilled. It was like I'd gotten a new instrument. And then I was kind of going, wow, this is, it's almost too easy to play. You know, it's like, I'm, come on, I'm supposed to have to work harder, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm checking it out and I realized that there was really, you know, you hold down the first fret yep. and then the 12th fret. And he's like, okay, how much relief is there? Like the way you have this set up, this is perfect. There's just a little relief in there. I'm glad and you that, like it. Yeah, yeah it's great. <laughs> and then, and that's what they had done at, at Roger's shop, you know, when they did the new setup after they did the refret and everything. And it felt amazing and it sounded great and there was no buzzing obviously you know of course there wasn't um and and everything was even and there, every note had nice punch and ringing clarity all the way up and down the neck I was like oh my god this is amazing so after that i was you know for ever since i was a kid in high school i would like take my bases apart i'm going to take the neck off you know and screw it up. i'm going to take the bridge off and see how this works you know and i did that with my first fender my mom bought me when i was a sophomore in high school and um and and after i had all that beautiful work done by roger's shop i kind of I was like, I'm not touching it. Mr. Anderson, step away from the bass, you know? I'm not gonna fiddle with the bridge. I'm not gonna fiddle with anything. I'm gonna leave it right like this. I want it to stay like this forever. And then of course, you know, living in the New York area, like I do, four season weather, and I'm sure you experienced this here as well, you know, the, there's the, the seasons change and the humidity changes in the air. You do have to make neck adjustments, but I would just do a little adjustment on the yeah. truss, you know, uh, spring and fall, just to kind of get it yeah. back where it should be. And um, yeah, oof, really nice. But it, you know, it, it can take years with an instrument. Each instrument has its own needs. You know, wouldn't you say it's like each one is different? Like this bass might have, like, sound great with a certain brand or gauge of strings, and yeah. it sounds better if the action's a little higher. Even you have to work a little harder, it sounds better. Other basses might sound great you know, with a completely different setup. You know, yeah. you almost you know, one size doesn't fit all. You really yeah. have to kind of listen to the bass and see what it feels like and see what it tells It's, it's kind of like um, studio monitors, you know, mm-hmm. like you just got to know what they sound like in your room, spend enough time with it mm-hmm. so that you can mix accordingly, you yeah, know, you try right. get a different set of speakers, they might be better but they'll sound different and then you might actually end up mixing wrong because you got to learn the monitors. You got to learn the monitors, you got right. to learn, learn your instrument. And learn your room too, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've had my home studio in a couple different rooms and I was kind of amazed to to hear mixes that I had done when I set up the monitors in in a different room. It's like, oh wow, that that low mid bump I've been used to for years that I could never get rid of, no matter what I did treating, yep. you know, with bass traps or anything. It was like, wow, it's not there anymore. Oh wow, this sounds very different. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like your ears get. It's like when we bring our bass amp to all the different gigs we do, yeah. and you know, you're just crushing your fingers, one. Oh, this room sounds good. Hope it sounds good. Hope it sounds good. <laughs> and you just know when you play two or three notes whether it's going to be a fun night or whether it's going to be like, I want to kill yeah. myself. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's the same setting as last night, but yeah. it's just nothing. Oh. And then you know, it, 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 this is what we go through as bass players at our cross to bear. You know, it, it, the the room can be destroying our bass sound. And in, in it really and truly, it's not our fault. We're doing what we can. We're trying to control our volume and everything else like that. But the finger gets pointed at us like we're too loud, we're too boomy, you know. Yep. Um, and 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 so it, in that respect, it can be a thankless job. You know, you kind of have to figure out all the strategies for, you know. I think for bass players, I, I know one thing I kind of learned l- later in the game was psychologically as a bass player, we we were kind of comforted physically and emotionally by the bottom of our instruments, mm-hmm. the bottom end of the sound, you know, because that's what other people get from us as a visceral experience as listeners or the other musicians on stage, and it's what we deliver. It's kind of our, our nurturing quality is to add that nice warm bottom end of the music. And so for a bass player to look at the bass knob on their amp and and uh, will themselves <laughs> to turn it down instead of turn it up. Yeah. It's like, no, don't don't make me do it. Don't make me turn it down. But sometimes a room, the best thing you can do to get a clearer bass sound and be able to hear yourself yeah. in the mix on stage is to turn the bass down and yeah. have less bass frequencies coming out of your amp. Yeah. You know, um, it was a, a little bit of a you know light bulb over my head when I finally realized that after years of doing this. You yeah. Know? It was totally. like, yeah. <laughs> but also I think you're right what you were saying earlier on, like mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of artists I think hear with their eyes. 
If you pull yeah. out a bass that looks like, you know, it's a coffee table bass with six strings, yeah. you get a thing in your yeah. head like what you're saying, oh, it's going to be it's going to be this. Whereas you, you pull out something that has Fender on the headstock and it looks like a P bass, they're going to be cool. That's right. Fine. Whether or not it sounds better or fits the music better or not, they, they've got this preconceived idea as soon as they see it. No, no question about it. And, yeah. you know, it, that's a, a, a part of a larger truth about human nature that certainly applies, you know, to the world of music. You know, one of the things along that same line that I've, I've always joked about for years is when somebody asks, oh, do, do you play upright? Um, and I actually have an electric upright. I have a, I endorse NS Design, the oh, Ned cool. Steinberger, when it's an unbelievable <clears throat> bass. It sounds great. And I can get around on it okay. You know, I can I can play it okay. Not like somebody who's played, you know, double bass their whole yeah. life, but I can get around on it. But people say, oh, do you play upright? It's like, we need upright for this gig. And so I'm like, oh yeah, okay, fine. What I'm thinking to myself is, okay, do you need upright because it really makes sense musically for the gig? Like you're playing maybe standards with a singer or a tenor player, and it's, you really want it to sound like nice mainstream jazz with real piano yeah. and, a, and an acoustic bass. I get that. Or like that's an old school Latin that, thing or something. Yeah, that's legitimate. I get that because that's a musical consideration. Yeah. Or is it that you actually want what I, I call the look of jazz? <laughs> you know, you want the guy the in the look. suit sweating profusely, hunched over the upright bass, yeah. and that's the look of jazz. That's like the image that you're selling um, and that's what the client wants so they go oh look it's jazz you know <laughs> yeah so you know that's just the reality of the business you know yeah um, mm. and then um, rig wise what do what you what do you generally run amp wise um, you know as I we mentioned we were talking about this before we got here um, I I've used I, I I've owned or used just about everything that's out there these days and and as I mentioned before, my, my little running joke is um, my favorite amp is the one I don't have to carry to the gig. So, um, but having said that, my personal favorite these days and, and for quite a few years has been Galleon Kruger. I just, I love the clarity and the, and the impact and the immediacy of the sound. Um, and it's like any other amp, every amp has a signature to the sound. Eden has a certain sound to it, that sort of warm, burnished sort of sound that's kind of like a, what we call it, a slightly soft-focused version of a DI, I guess you could say. Okay. SWR had that bright, airy, kind of almost clattery mid-range that gives it good you know, definition in a mix on stage. Ampeg is the classic chocolatey, yeah. chewy kind of fat bottom thing, wide, that sounds great for a lot of kinds of music. Every amp has its signature sound. But um, the, the Galleon stuff for me just works in the most <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, number of different kinds of settings musically. I just plug in and then I can just, I know how to set it to get the, what I want. And then I can just get back to the matter at hand, which is thinking about the music yeah. and not thinking about the amp. Yeah. You know. But I'm really, I'm really not that picky about amps because I've, I've learned over the years when you travel. Uh, I mean, I've never been involved in a tour that was a big enough affair, in terms of this, the size of the operation that there was, you know, there were equipment semi trucks, you know, with everyone's stuff all going from one city to the next. You know, the reality for, for the kind of touring I do uh, with jazz and fusion type artists and stuff like that is it's just I, I have my bass in the gig bag and I, you know, make nice with the flight attendant or the gate agent at the airport, get into the overhead bin. It's like, okay, I'm safe on this one. And then I'm just plugging into whatever amp is there whatever at the day. venue. Um, and, <clears throat> and really, any of the major amp brands that I'm going to run into, I know how to get the sound I want to hear out of any of the commonly seen uh, rental amps that, yep. that you would get in a different venue. So I just go, okay, it's going to be one of those today. Fine. Boom. I know how to get the sound I like with, with this, mm -mm, a little mid out on this, and mm -hmm. good, I'm done. Yep. And then I just get to work. Any know. pedals? Pedal board yeah, up? you know, I've, I've kind of gone mm -hmm. all over the spectrum over the years with, with different pedals. Um, I do have like a little mini pedal board that I kind of like that I use now. It's a, um, it's just two things on it. It's um, a Line Six. Uh, what's it called? An M9. It's it's uh, it's kind of like the the digital modeling of the classic analog effects pedals. Okay. Um, and I it it'll do any three effects um, uh, at at a time, and um, it, it's. You know any of those multi-effect things? I'm I'm not 
making any criticism here of Line 6. Their stuff is great. Roland or Korg, Yama, they all make great stuff, you know. But as a general principle, anytime you try to have an all-in-one box that does everything, inevitably there's going to be some things that you go, wow, that's really great, and some other stuff where you go, well, I can't really use that, you know. Yeah. And uh, for me... And, and we were just talking about this before, looking at your pedal board here, I commented on your your um, your Boss Octave pedal, which you know we love. It's like the, the great go-to, yeah. sound like a synth keyboard bass for, for an electric bass player um, that, that just has really stood the test of time, and I've, I've gone through two or three of them. So if I get any kind of multi-effect thing like that, I'm always thinking, okay, the first one of the first things I do is let me find the octave you know, patch yep. and see if it sounds as good as the boss. And the reality is, I have to say, unfortunately, I have yet to find one that, yeah. that sounds as good Unless as the... Unless it's a boss multi-effect pedal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I, I had one of those a GT6B, that big red yeah, bass one. Yeah, I had one. one as well. And the, the, the octave sound in that was sort of a digital version of the old analog brown pedal that you've mm. got here. But it actually was close enough that... I was very happy to use that for years on yeah. gigs. Um, the Line Six, unfortunately, the octave not thing quite. is not really, not really great. And then the other thing, it's not terrible. It's just it doesn't have that same chewy, elastic, yeah. punchy quality that sort of sounds like a nice synth sound yep. doubling along with your bass. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that, as bass players, we all love, of course, is the envelope filter effect. Yeah, uh, the one in the Line Six is okay. <laughs> It's it's not amazing. It's okay. The distortions are amazing. The delays yeah. are amazing in that. Yeah. Like I said, everything is... If, you know, a lot of guys just go in, and the guitar players in particular go into the a la carte, you know, just pick the boutique pedal that does yeah. the cool thing that you want. And ultimately, if you're going to be, the, you know, put the sonics at the, the, the forefront in terms of your fact, your decision making, that's what you got to do. Then you're just dealing with the bulk of something that's bigger. Yeah. Right, like that, you know. <laughs> Um, the the line six thing is just the advantage with it, as it is with any of those multi effects things is it's just one little compact thing with one power supply yeah. and you're done. And then the other thing I have on the pedal board is um, uh, one of those um, uh, Tech Twenty One uh, VT bass, okay, the Sansan yeah. Sand pedal, yep. which I love. It's great because it's basically the idea is that it's intended to emulate kind of the the classic Ampeg SVT. Yeah sound plus in general kind of all the different sort of tube rock bass amp kind of sounds that you would want to get and and it is really great at that and um uh i've even used it uh in in fact we did a tour a couple of years ago with with bill evans in russia and the amps that they had available the back line it was really pretty spotty it was you know sometimes it would be like okay the amp works other times it would just be distorting and i'd be like oh no you know right. they just don't have you know good backline stuff available there so um i brought the the vt bass with me and i used it not with the the tube amp emulation but just like cl as a clean preamp with three bands of eq and ran into that and bypassed the preamp on whatever the amp was and plugged right into the power amp and a couple of times i think i even just plugged into the use it as a di and then came out through the wedge with that and it it's it's it saved me completely it gave me a, a, a yeah. sound that i had control over um so that's kind of my basic little pedal board thing i've, I've gone back and forth over the years but i with pedals and feeling like I want or need to have them on the gig, but I, I really have to say this. I mean, for me as a working bass player with all the different kinds of gigs I do, 95% um, of the time, I'm just playing a clean bass sound, and if there's a pedal on the floor, it's bypassed and I'm going right into the amp. I mean, it's really, you know, I'm, I, I would be totally happy if I just plugged right from the jack into the amp for the rest of my life. Mm. You know, I don't have to have any of that other stuff. It, it gets to be more interesting and fun and useful in a setting like the trio project I mentioned, yeah. the original thing, yeah. where it's um, there's no guitar or keyboard. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of filling some of those that role sonically, and I can get kind of more ambient delay type uh, sounds and swirly different kind of sounds and get away from the functional foundational sound of the bass in that kind of setting because there's room to do it. You know, a lot of times for bass, if you're in a band, a regular ensemble rhythm section with front people and whatever, you really can't do that much to the sound of the bass to mess with it without 
bugging people without somebody saying, you know, can you please get back to a bass sound that's doing what we need here, you yeah. know, apart from, like I said, the classic Boss Octave pedal. If you want that mini Moog, you know, the Stevie Wonder, Chaka Khan, that whole kind of cool 80s R&B dance music synth bass sound, it's great for that, you yeah. know, it's great for that stuff. But other than that, you know, le less is more, I would say. Mm. So you've, you, you've done a lot of sideman gigs where you said, you know, Bill Evans calls you and he, hey, can you be in Europe in two weeks? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you prepare for that kind of stuff? I mean, I'm guessing there'd be some kind of charts get sent out or, I mean, a combination of just digging through the back catalogue. I don't know what it's like for myself when I get a gig on the weekend, you look at Celis and you go, okay, I've got to learn these things. Mm -hmm. And um, committing stuff to memory when, mm -hmm. when you're doing so m much work, you know, so many mm -hmm. different kinds of bands and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I struggle with, is this the one where it goes to the two in the bridge or is it? Yeah, that, of know? course. And you've got to perform and you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So how, yeah. what's your kind of gig preparation? Well, that that's a great uh, question because that's kind of, I, I feel like that's, that's like the proverbial, the tip of the iceberg that is the gig. Yeah. And the whole iceberg is everything that you have yeah. to do to get you to know. being ready for the gig. Um, so <clears throat> I, I would say that, you know, for, I mean, every gig, every situation is different. Um, but I definitely have a, a well honed working methodology in terms of how I prepare for music. I have to, because I get called by so many different people for so many different gigs that if I didn't have a real system in place yeah. to make sure that the, the end result is the fi the objective, the final objective obviously is that. I, I need to make sure that my preparation leads to me showing up for the gig, no matter what it is, um, whether it's, you know, I don't think of a gig as quote unquote important or not important. I gotta, I have to hold myself to the same high standard regardless of what the gig is. Because especially in this day and age with people pointing their phones at you at gigs and everything, there's there's really no such thing as a gig that, that no one's going to hear about yeah. or see or anything like that. So I, I, I kind of, in the back of my mind, I'm always showing up at any gig I do, no matter what it is, whether it's a, an artist gig or a local gig or whatever it is, I just assume and expect that what I'm doing could get you know saved for posterity somehow, audio, video, whatever and that um, I'm gonna have to be able to stand behind the work I'm doing. So it just doesn't really leave any margin for error. And there's also my own, my own pride in the quality of work I do. Sure. And for me, ultimately, the satisfaction of, of doing this and continuing to do it um, uh, has to stem in large part from this, the feeling that, that I'm getting the job done right, that I'm doing it at the level I want, that I'm meeting my own high standards. Excuse me, and then at that point, it's like whatever else is going on around me, I hope everybody else is applying themselves the same way. I hope the music sounds great. I hope the audience likes it. I hope all those nice things happen. But if they don't, you know, I can't let that like blow me out of the water or get me bent out of shape. I just need to stay focused on, you know, how good of a job that I do, did I meet my own standards? Mm -hmm. And then you just, you know, go on from there. Um, so having said all that, um, you know, typically nowadays, uh, when I do a gig with someone, the common scenario, the ideal scenario, I should say, is somebody sends me, um, maybe they send me a Dropbox link or something like that. Yep. And um, uh, there's a nice neat folder in there with everything carefully organized Hopefully. with P PDFs of all the uh, charts and they're nice, good, clean charts that somebody did in Sibelius, which I use, or Finale or whatever. Um, or maybe they're just good, neat manuscript that they've, they've scanned. Um, and then, uh, you know, a, a folder of MP3s of everything. And ideally, if, if there's specific things about the live versions or arrangements that I should hear, it's a good, clean, clear recording from their this person's gig where I can really hear what's going on, of how the tune should really go yeah. um, on the gig. And then, you know, also sometimes um, it'll be that plus like the studio version. So I, the studio version lets me hear the, the original part in a very clean, kind of clinical, separated sort of way. That's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. and then I can hear like that person's live band um, doing, doing the music 
live here how the you know after the bridge it opens up for solos you break it down the guy raps with the crowd and then it builds up and then the cue goes to letter c or whatever whatever you know and then uh but the reality is that um even with artists i work with who are really diligent and attentive to providing all of that yeah. um, um it's inevitable that none of that is going to be 100% in alignment and correct. So that that's the point where my work really begins. Um, mm. I have to make kind of educated guesses uh, if I can't get in touch with the person and say, look, did you really mean for it to be that or this or whatever? And because sometimes, you know, I do a lot of gigs where I'll get that the materials to prepare and everything and there's no rehearsal. We yeah. might run stuff and sound check. We might run beginnings and endings or like, yeah, this one's hard, let's run the whole thing top to bottom, make sure we're good, watch them for the cue at the end, and we all play the lick together or whatever it is. But I do tons of work with like, you know, recording artist type people where there's literally no rehearsal. So you gotta be, the homework is paramount. Yeah. You know, you gotta be ready to walk in. Gotta be over-prepared. Over-prepared, that's a great way to put it. And I've heard people use that term before. Yeah, you know, somebody said to me, a drummer said to me the other day in a gig, they said, yeah, I learned my lesson, man. I'm going to be like over-prepared like Dave Anderson. And I was like, well, nice. hey, it's a nice compliment. I'll take yeah. it, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why you're still working. Well, yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good part of it. Um, you know, it's really, I mean, musicians don't tend to think this way, but I, I kind of think in a sense, I mean, we, we all like to think of ourselves as, as artists in some sense, and we all are certainly, we're not taking that away, but also in a sense, in a more pragmatic business sense, it's a service industry, mm -hmm. you know? I look at what I do as providing a service. Somebody's paying me, and in exchange for that, what they want is great sounding bass. And they want great sounding bass parts on their songs. They want it to sound like I play with them. They don't want it to sound like I'm fumbling and learning the tunes on the gig, mm -hmm. you know? And they want me to be attentive to direction from them or their music director or whoever's calling the shots, and you have to kind of keep your ego well tamped down and just be flexible and adjustable and just kind of do what people ask you to do. You know, it's funny, I, I think one of the, the Achilles heel for a lot of musicians because, you know, they, they get, they're passionate about their art and their craft and the, their, the finding their own voice and all that stuff. And they get in a gig and they tend to be kind of rigid sometimes and they tend to be sort of a stick in the mud about taking direction or just doing what they're being asked or told to do or whatever. And I really think that the best thing you can do in terms of having a nice, relaxed, calm mindset in a gig and not getting your, your nose out of joint is just saying, you know what, it's, I'm the one with the skills here playing bass and that's why they're hiring me, but it's their music. And so whatever they want within reason is fine. Yeah. If they don't want me to play, if they want me to be tacit and letter B, I'll be tacit on letter B. I don't have to play letter B. Yeah. If they want me to play quiet, more quietly, I can do that. I, I, I can control my volume. I don't have to be loud. If they do want me to be loud, I'll be loud. You know, I've had, I, I get both, you know. I have a friend, uh, uh, an old drummer friend of mine, Joel Rosenblatt, who actually used to play with, with uh, Bill's band yeah, I know uh, for years. For sure. um, and his, his running joke with one of his running <clears throat> jokes with me, we've been friends for years, he says, yeah, Dave Anderson, the world's quietest bass player. And it's like, uh, you know, I'd rather somebody tell me to turn up than tell me to turn down. It says, you know? Yeah, it kind of says a lot about your... Um your playing personality, I think, if you're always the guy who's getting asked to turn down. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And, you know, I think also, and you know this because you have your studio and stuff, you learn to think like uh, um, a mixing engineer and a producer yeah. and listen with producer ears and, yeah. and engineer ears and hear the overall balance of what's going on around you and hear yourself as part of a blend and not yeah. just listen to yourself. Absolutely. And I think it's really good practice to record yourself. Yeah, a lot, so you can hear More yourself. The you know, with, with drum loops and changes or whatever like yeah, that, absolutely. so you can actually hear yourself in context. Because I know I, I was that bass player when I was young, starting mm -hmm. out playing. I was always loud. You know, me too. It's, it's exciting, and you want to hear sure. yourself. And your ears haven't you haven't trained your ears enough to be able to hear yourself at a quieter volume. That's right. That's right. And I it's think. yeah, and it's emotional. It's like music. It's natural when you get excited and you're excited about the music and playing yeah. and also there's a part of you which is tied to your ego yeah. um, which is you want people to listen to the music and pay attention and be involved and excited you know the worst thing for a musician in a sense is to look out in the room and see that no one is really paying attention mm. you know um, when you're young 
you know, you don't kind of have the, the wisdom and experience to just kind of not let that bother you if it happens, you know. Uh, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's something about learning to just kind of, okay, I can just do my job and whatever you need is fine. You know, you kind of flip it around in your mind and say, okay, if I was in this other person's shoes, and I was paying, it's like you pay a guy to come to your house and fix something with the plumbing under the sink or fix an electrical outlet or something. You go, well, okay, I'm paying you X amount. And in exchange for that, I expect you to do a great job of fixing the outlet mm. and without any issues or problems and then demonstrate to me that it's been repaired <clears throat> properly when you're done. And then I'm happy. Yeah. I'm getting something in exchange for my money. And in a sense, as prosaic as it sounds, it's the same thing that's happening when I call for a gig, you know? Yeah. Somebody's paying me money in exchange, they have a reasonable set of expectations, we hope it's reasonable, mm -hmm. um, about what they want in return. I'm happy to provide that, you know? So it is, it's a service industry in a sense, yeah. in that regard, you know? Not to diminish it or belittle it, or say it's only that, but, but in a realistic sense, in terms of making a living day to day as a musician, that, that's a big part yeah. of it. Yeah, and somebody said to me a while ago, you know, we're also in the, we're in the business of selling beers. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, the, sure. Keeping the venue happy. You know. Well, yeah, beers and, you know, in a, in a larger sense, in terms of the different business models that you see, the reality is that, you know, all too often, for better or worse, if, if we see a successful business model where live music is being presented, whether uh, wherever you are in the food chain of the industry, from a top level name artist all the way down to playing at a local bar or pub or something, the reality is that very often when the business model works and is sustainable, whether we like it or not, it's because there's some other tie-in with some other kind of product or service or attraction that's making it work in a, in a synergistic way yeah. that, that so that people aren't being expected to fill seats up and, and open up their wallets strictly in the basis of sitting and listening to music. We would all maybe wish or hope that that is the case, but the reality yeah. is that's just unless, not the case. Unless it's a theater show or a stadium or a you yeah, know, exactly. concert. That's right. But if you're that's playing right. any kind of you know, local venue, it's mm -hmm. going to be food and drinks and sure. atmosphere. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know uh, if um, uh, if this is um, something that exists here or is common in Australia, but in the States, uh, the casinos um, have become kind of the dirty little secret of the touring business. You have these casinos um, all over uh, the States in different places and they have the casinos got smart years ago and decided to expand from the traditional las vegas model and atlantic city model of just gambling mm. and people going there for degenerate purposes and the idea that you could open it up clean it up clean up the image and uh, hopefully get rid of the you know the unsavory aspects of it and sell it as family entertainment and then you have nice restaurants you get a shopping mall yeah. you got the the club nightclubs that have bands you got the big theater or the auditorium or the you know the big music room where the name rock and pop acts come in and then it becomes a destination and so yeah you know mom or dad want to go to the and play the tables or the slots in the afternoon and but then the whole family's going to go out to dinner and yeah. then bah, 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 and that kind of thing so it's like you know that kind of tie-in thing you know, it's a, one of the one of the successful models in the industry is is creating that thing where it ties in with something else. Mm. You know, and uh, you know the casino thing. It's like a lot of the people. One of the people I play with uh, occasionally is uh, uh, Smokey Robinson, the great Motown uh, artist mm. legend, um, and I do a ton of casino gigs with yeah. him. You know. Uh, the the sort of oldies acts and stuff. I did Blood, Sweat and Tears for years. We did tons of casinos. Um, you know, that's just part of the scene. Somebody like Bill wouldn't be in a place like that because he's not like an oldies or a nostalgia sure, yeah. act. But, you know, name any of your favorite bands that are still around where they're one or two surviving members from the 60s or 70s or 80s and yeah. chances are good they're, they're they've got a lot of casino dates on their, on their tour itineraries. Yeah, right. Uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears. Yeah. That, what, what was that like? It was it was a lot of fun. It was great. Um, it was, uh, I guess, in the category of what it is, being you know kind of an, an oldies gig, you could call it. I guess not to diminish it, but that's what it is. I mean, the band had its big hits when I was, um, you know, a, a, this big. You know, Spent spinning wheel. Yeah, all that stuff. And one time, uh, the, the woman came up to me after a gig, 
And I understand that you know if you shave your head, maybe it's a little hard to kind of tell how old somebody is. Like I have gray hair or whatever, yeah. you can't really tell how old I am. But um, she came up to me. She said, "Excuse me, are you one of the original members?" And I just laughed. I said, um, "No, I was in second grade when Spinning Wheel was a number one hit in the United States." But thanks for aging me by twenty years. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. It's Blood, Sweat, and Tears is kind of a musical institution. Um, many friends of mine around New York have been in and out of the band over the years. I think if you look on their Wikipedia mm -hmm. page for Blessed and Tears, there's a, someone, I don't know how they did this, they got this exhaustive list of every musician that's ever toured or recorded in the band, and it's something like 175 guys. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I, I did it as a sub for the regular guy, amazing bass player, New York guy named Gary Foote for years and then ultimately I was officially in the band for several years and it was a blast. It's, you know, those are great classic songs and, and Blood, Sweat and Tears kind of has their rightful place in mm -hmm. rock history um, as really one of the very first bands to be a rock band with a jazz horn section on mm -hmm. top. Like you Chicago, know. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even more so like it was Randy Brecker, Lou Soloff, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, it was like real guys that were really serious players. And then the rock part underneath was kind of the hip rock of the day, the late 60s kind of rock sound. But on top, the arranging and the horn stuff was these burning young jazz guys. Um, and it was, excuse me, at the time, that was a very innovative, you know, fresh sound. And um, so they've always attracted great players to be part of the band. It's always been great guys. Any, I did the gig uh, over the years, I did the gig off and on. Um, you know, any number of different guys in the horn section, rhythm section guys would come and go, different singers up front. Mm. It always sounded great. It's always great guys, you know, and fun music to play. I, I enjoyed it. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Cool. Yeah. And what are, you, what are you kind of doing generally around New York? I mean, after, once you get back from from here with Bill, what's kind of next uh, in your calendar? We, we've got, uh, we've got another date with Bill. We're doing a, a jazz festival in, in New York State, Rochester, I think. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's going to be the same band as, as this one here, but it's going to be uh, Keith Carlock on drums rather wow. than Poojie Bell. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, but you know, day-to-day -day work for me, um, you know, the reality of being um, a working player and making a living at it, particularly if you're like me and teaching is not really part of your pie chart in that <laughs> regard. Um, if you live in New York, there's, you know, with the, the studio scene having dwindled and disappeared some mm. years ago, uh, really one of the few revenue streams in terms of a regular gig you can make a living at in New York is doing Broadway pits. Now, I'm not doing a Broadway show now, and I haven't for years, but I did two Broadway shows. Oh, wow. I replaced uh, the original bass player at Hairspray, the original Broadway production of Hairspray. That's a great booth. That did that for like half a year and then was subbed there a bit. And then out of that, I got called uh, to play a show. This is going back about 12 years or so at this point called Lennon, about John Lennon. Right. And um, the the show came and went quickly, yeah. um, uh, uh, but which is kind of more the norm than the exception in the Broadway world. But, mm. you know, there there's a lot of players. There's a whole circle of musicians, great players in New York who kind of hover and live in that that world and they do a show and the show runs six months or a year or a year and a half or three years or whatever and then the show closes ultimately and then they have all the connections in place and they just kind of leapfrog swing from one vine to the next and go to another show and then mm -hmm. they do another show as long as it lasts and that's just kind of their thing I, I was in a position where I was kind of entertaining the idea that that would happen for me, I enjoyed the work and hanging out with some great musicians and being part of those things, but uh, for several reasons, I, I saw that it wasn't going to be like a, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, you yeah. know? Partly, be, well, for, firstly, just because really as a musician, I, I love the spontaneity of playing live and playing a lot of different styles of music and different stuff, and it's really, it's a numbing, you know, kind of process to have to play the same thing the same exact way eight times a week. You just, wow. you become brain dead, yeah. you know, and even great players just sort of become, you know, almost catatonic, you know, after yeah. a while. Um, and another thing was, it's just in terms of the scheduling, you commit to doing a show and 
Um, you have to turn down. It kind of yeah, it usurps a you know a huge chunk of your life. And for me, as I mentioned, we were talking before um, living a little more than an hour north of New York City. Just the commute time mm. added in to being there for the show and all that other stuff. It was basically like a like a full time job for me to be in in the city. It was like over eight hours door to door for me to just do one show, yeah. um, and so that's like eating up a big chunk of your life. And in exchange for that, you're getting a paycheck. So it's all you know, exactly, yeah. quid pro quo. But um, uh, I, I ultimately just kind of decided I wasn't gonna, you know, uh, try at all costs to stay in that in that world it was great i had fun doing it so back to your question about day-to-day -day gigs I, I don't do that but the other thing in new in the new york area that is still a, a very viable source of income for all kinds of musicians is playing private party work you know okay um uh weddings and corporate events and stuff like that and that stuff pays better in the new york area than it does anywhere else i mean it pays mm. more than twice what it pays for example out around uh, la you know on the west coast um, and um, and if you're in with good circles of musicians and stuff, people like myself who are touring with, you know, name artists and stuff and have some, some great credentials under their belt are doing that kind of work on weekends when they're home. So um, it's not uncommon to be on a band on a gig like that and everyone you look at around you on the gig is home from a tour with a big artist, you know, Bruce Springsteen or Average White Band or yeah. or whatever, something like that. So you're playing with great players and everybody shows up as a pro and knows the songs cool. and stuff. So you have fun and it pays well. And you know, kind of top 40 classics. Yeah, all yeah. this stuff, right, exactly. The whole, the whole gamut of stuff. So that's one of the things that when I'm not in the road, I'm filling in my 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 weekends with backing vocals. Do you do any backing? I don't. Vocals? I don't. You know, I I it's actually it's funny you should ask because <laughs> I um, the only gig I've ever done any background singing on is this gig and the Bill Evans gig. Oh. Um, and a bit years ago, when I first started playing with Bill, he he was getting into doing his lead vocal thing, and he really wanted to have some guys in the band helping him out with some background vocals. So he didn't feel like he was just out there alone, you know. Um, and I wanted to be a good sport and also make sure I kind of kept the gig, you know? <laughs> um, so I was like, everyone else was going, rrr, 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 you know, what'd you say? Sorry, I didn't hear you, you know? And I was like, all right, Bill, I'll do it. So um, I, I allowed myself to be roped into it and I did the best I could. It was, uh, I'm like any musician who's not like a trained singer. My mother was um, a classical singer and, and taught voice and, and worked as a freelance vocalist. So she, you know, I grew up hearing somebody really who knew what they were doing as a singer, but I never studied voice seriously. Yeah. I never learned to sing um, and didn't do it, you know, in bands and stuff. So I didn't have those kind of chops or anything. And I, you know, the hard part for me is the rubbing your head and patting your tummy at the same time, having a bass groove going. Yeah. And then having a even a simple background part, and I would sit there and painstakingly write out on a grand staff the vocal part and the bass part, and then take it one measure at a time and look at the composite rhythm of okay, the yeah. the vocal part and the bass part, and excuse me, just kind of play it out of time, and it's like you know boop dee doo be boom do boop, boop you know whatever, and just do it really slow, and then get it up to speed with a metronome. Yeah. And I had to literally <clears throat> learn the stuff one or two bars at a time like that, and I got it together. You know, I was proud of myself cool. for being yeah. a good sport and getting it together, but. At various points, Bill had other guys in the band, like guitarist and even dr the drummer, who was the lead vocalist for a while. It was amazing, Josh Dion, and these guys were real singers. Yeah. So I was like, "Fine, that that's your job. You're the pro." And I kind of gingerly stepped away from the mic yeah. and decided to leave that to the guys who knew what they were doing. You maybe maybe um, missed out on some work. I know I know around town, it's, it's no question. If you can have a trio and and, mm. and you can sing a, a couple of songs as there's as no bass question. Player. You know, mm -hmm. that you're instantly more hireable. There's no question about yeah. it. There's no question about it. Um, and I just, it's one of those things. There's a couple things, I guess, if somebody said, well, you know, uh, it's like the old Frank Sinatra song, regrets, I've had a few. Um, you know, what do I regret that I wish I could have done differently as a young musician starting out? Two things. I wish I had learned to sing early on and gotten confident at it and good at it and just learned by singing in bands. Yeah. So I could just not be the world's greatest singer, just be a good, competent, at ease with being a lead vocalist, have a repertoire yeah. and know my range and know which singer's <clears throat> material I would be good at doing, you know, that and, uh, and developing piano skills, which I never did. Right. So 
those that's my it's not a it's a it's a short list but those are the two things that I I wish I had I had done it, really there was only one gig in I would say in my career that I kind of was like drats I really wish I had been able to offer that with the singing and that was um, uh, Hiram Bullock the late oh, great wow. guitar player um, I was subbing for Will Lee actually uh, on Hiram's trio gig this is probably gosh more than 15 years ago maybe almost closer to 20 years ago um, Hiram was just doing gigs around town and it was Will and, and the drummer was a good friend of mine this great New York drummer Clint DeGannon and Clint was nice enough to kind of make introductions and kind of suggest that I come in and fill in when Will had to go on the road and so I did it and I had a great time we did you know a handful of gigs with Hiram but um, obviously Will is a great singer you yeah. know um, and was offering that um, and all three of the guys in the band sang Hiram sang and the drummer right. also sang and so I didn't have that to offer and I think you know Hiram ultimately if he was going to bring somebody into his gig and kind of have them be part of his regular touring thing mm. um, you know because Will was going to be sticking around New York doing the show and everything else he was doing um, it needed to be somebody who not just not only played bass great but also was a strong singer as well so you know for probably for at least that reason if not others I, I didn't ultimately you know get the call for continuing to do that gig so but you know that's a, a, yeah. a minor you know, um, disappointment. I got to play with Hiram. That was pretty cool. It seems like, yeah. you know, Hiram's band was a bit of a breeding ground for lots of players coming through in New York, almost like a yeah, uh, fire by fire in a way as yeah. well. Yeah, and as part of the New York scene in general, going back to the 80s and stuff, you know, it was so many great players kind of all part of a community and, you know, all playing together and guys mixing and matching and, and Jack stuff. Jackal played with him, didn't he? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, Absolutely. The tree, was that the trio with them, or was that? Um, well, Hi Hiram and Jocko had, I don't even know who was playing drums. It was, uh, uh, it was um, Kenwood Denard or Charlie mm -hmm. Drayton, somebody like that. Yeah, you know, those guys all had different combinations of bands, and they were just playing in bars in the village and stuff, you yeah. know. It was great as, as a mu young musician to go hear those guys. You'd you'd go and just walk into a place you had no idea who you were going to hear. It was like, wow, check it out, it's Hiram with, you know, this guy or that guy. You, you didn't see Jekyll? I never did. That's yeah. it's uh, unfortunately he's one of the one of the people I um, I never did see yeah. play live that I, I wish I I had. Um, he died in eighty seven, so I was like what twenty four, twenty five years old at the time, yeah. um, and. and um, you know, he was kind of already into his downward spiral, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, this was, you know, by the time I was out yeah. playing and stuff and aware of what he had already <clears throat> done and everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, he it was past his weather report years and everything like that, sure. the Joni Mitchell stuff. So I never, I never had it. I mean, I could have gone into the city and heard him, you know, one of those little bar gigs or something with Hiram or any of those guys, yeah. you know. But, you know, his his great work, I think most of us agree, you know that his his great work was the early weather report, heavy weather, and the beautiful stuff he did with Joni Mitchell, yeah. um, Hegira, and word and of Mingus, band. and yeah, word of mouth big band, and you know his first couple solo records, you know, um, you know were incredible. That's his legacy. Is that beautiful? Yeah. That beautiful work, you know. Hey, if if, if only my good day could be as yeah. good as Jacko's worst day. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, man, that's that's that's, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. It was, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate you calling me, Craig. No worries, man. Awesome, and yeah. uh, best of luck with everything here in uh, in Melbourne. Thanks, man. And um, but uh, here's my last question for I have a question for you now. You've oh. been asking me questions. Is it no. Melbourne or Melbourne, or is it somewhere in the middle? It's if well, if you're from here, uh -huh. it's actually Melbourne. Melbourne. Okay. Melbourne. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I'm a pro. Now I know the right way yeah. to say it. Because I, I started hearing people before I left say it both ways. And I said, well, well, wait a minute. Can I Google this? Can I find out the right way to say it so I don't embarrass myself? Because it looks like Melbourne on yeah. you look on paper. And it's like, well, okay. The, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. It is, yeah. yeah. It's like um, Ed Edinburgh. Yeah, right. Sure. Americans say Edinburgh. Right, right. Sure. <laughs> what? Of course. Like it's it's brah. Right? Yeah, Edinburgh. Gotcha. There you go. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, pleasure. That's it. Guys, really thanks for great. watching. Thanks for listening. 
um, check out. Um, you got a website and stuff on you? Got I sh- oh, yeah, I sure do. It's um, DaveAndersonBase.com. Um, and if you're curious to see a list of uh, records that I've played on, my discography is on there. I keep uh, an up-to-date um, list of uh, my upcoming performances so you can always see. Uh, where I'm playing uh, and uh, you know usual biography and my credits and all that kind of stuff are all on there and I'm usually pretty good about keeping it updated as my being my own chief webmaster so uh, uh, yeah you can always uh, find me there or of course we're all on Facebook like gazillions of other people nowadays so awesome cool man pleasure thank you great nice one great hey man Appreciate it. Thank you. Great.